December the 13th, right? 12th. 12th. Mm -hmm. December the 12th. And we're going to start with talking about uh, Fanny, Lenora, Barbara, Newbert, Armstrong, which was my grandmother, and Joe's great grandmother. And uh, we always called Granny Armstrong, people who called her a name would call her Fanny. And that's what most people knew her as. But her parents came to this country because of the revolt and the absolute uh, loss of food and ways to earn a living that was occurring in Prussia back in the 1800s. And during that time in Prussia, the, all of the crops had failed for several years in a row and the royalty of that heir and that community and land part and all were trying to tr figure out what to do with the people and how to get the country back on its feet and because of that people were trying to leave and the best place to go was to come to the new world. And during this time, uh, a lot of the more prominent families in Knoxville came from that same area. And if you look at a map of the 1820s of Prussia and look at it today, it's just like Fountain City is to Knoxville. It's, they're almost overlapping. They're so close where they actually were living at that time. But the passport for Granny Armstrong's grandfather said that he was 45 years old with blonde hair, blonde eyebrows, blue-gray eyes, missing teeth, a full chin, a healthy face, and no peculiar signs. And along with this it said that he had the necessary passports and papers to leave the country. And he was being traveled with his wife, three children, and one servant. And uh, there's been a lot of history about that group of people who came to America and I think it would help for people to understand and the family to understand what this uh, Mr. Mook, M-U-K-E, wrote about this time in Knoxville. And I would like to read that. It says, The German colony at Wartburg received the first immigrants in the summer of 1846. And by the year 1850, there were over 2,000 immigrants in Wartburg. If you can think about that area even having 2,000 residents. Some moved on into Knoxville, and some located around and even went as far as the Chrises, who are now in Knoxville, went first to Nashville. The names of some of these families that we all will recognize and know are Man, which was Straw Man, <coughs> the Weigels, the Chrises, the Hensons, the Hoffs, the Newberts, and then Granny Armstrong's family, the Nycounters. And these people came in to Wartburg because there had been a colony set up by three men and it was called the Tennessee Colonization Company and they started in 1800s early and purchased 6,000 acres around Wartburg and it was in this area that they sold people in Saxony and that area land to come in and stay and start a new life in this world. And the principals in the venture was the Knucklemans, 
the Geldings, the Gerthers, and they were three German businessmen who set up this company. And the colony sold the families on the land and the families came to this country thinking the land was developed like it was in Prussia that they were leaving. And this caused a lot of problems because on the ship that uh, the Newberts and the Nykounters and the Weigels came together, uh, there were a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers, artists, professional people. And when they got to the colony at Wartburg, there was one log building and that they all had to stay in sort of like a uh, dormitory until they built a log house to live in. And this is not what the people had been told. But it was possible to grow and have food and things that they couldn't do if they had stayed there. All of the people that came during this time uh, left Wartburg except for about four families through the years. And they've settled mostly in the Knoxville area. The Naffles, who were Naffle Studio here in town, were part of them. And it's really interesting to know about that part of the history. Can we stop a minute? Sure. I've got a fly. Many of the people that had bought land and that our Newbert relative had bought 400 acres in Wartburg, although they were thinking that it was developed land, it turned out to be a wilderness and a really just a woods. The families as they arrived at this colony were in 1846 the Weisenbergers and the Chrises. In 1847 the Mulligans and the Snyders came. In 1848, the Newberts and the Weigels moved in. And in 1949 and 50, the Strucks and some more Snyders came and the Naples came. And in 1846, this group of people, most of them uh, that had come were Lutherans. And uh, they some belonged to the different Reformed Church of Sweden, but they decided that they wanted to build a church that everyone could uh, worship in. And the uh, first minister that they had uh, doctor, uh, was a doctor, and he was neither the Reformed Party or the Lutheran Party. And so the Weigels and the Newberts all started working and they finally charted and started the German Lutheran Church of Wartburg. And when they did this, uh, they hired a pastor who was a Carl Frederick von Forstner, who was their minister during that time. Our relatives, the Godfrey uh, Newbert, they left uh, Saxony, Germany on June 1848. They had three children, one slave or servant, and the couple. And they were crossing uh, and left out of Belgium, Belgium and then came into New York. And this was in June of 1848. Uh, they made arrangements and although the Dr. Mulk has said that it was uh, done immediately, there's work and reports that Godfrey Newbert decided to go to school in New York for a six months period before they started moving south to the Wartburg colony. And to get to Wartburg, they had a steamer uh, that they acquired passage on to Charleston, South Carolina. And then they went from Charleston by wagon to Chattanooga, then up through Tennessee to Kingston, and then by wagon on over to Wartburg, arriving in October 
1848. So they were traveling from June until October. And that doesn't sound like he could have been six full months like some of the letters state. So I wonder if it wasn't months, but with the translations that it was really weeks that he maybe took a six-week course on something in this new country. So in the year of 1851, Godfrey was known to hold in excess of 400 acres of land in the colony. And the partnership that had been set up uh, between he and the Strikers and the Weigels was to develop a sheep raising farm. And this endeavor was considered a complete failure by the year of 1851. <laughs> Dr. Brandon and Dr. Edward Faults were engaged as medical doctors in this colony. And they were part of the sheep farming and they were buying sheep and trying to raise them that were dying faster than they were getting them on the farm. So they hired at the cost of $500 two sheep farmers that came over from Saxony. But during this time, Godfrey Newbert and Weigel decided that Wartburg was not where they wanted to continue. So they just started looking for a place to live and they came, Godfrey came down into Knoxville and he rented a wagon and a mule on Hill Avenue and started driving east. And all my life I've been told that the Newberts came to Knoxville because the McNutts offered to give them land to be buried on and that was very important. It turns out this is not the story that has been written about them, about a man that was there during the time. So they moved, kept looking, and uh, Godfrey found some property on the Holston River, what is now called the Forks of the River, and he bought an estate from a family that lived in Nashville that had bought it. And the property there was suitable for raising sheep, he thought. So his friend Weigel came along and bought the joining properties. And there they started again to set up their sheep farming. And <coughs> The sheep farming turned out to not be as profitable as uh, Godfrey Newbert and the Weigels had thought. So they both then went into raising different kinds of wheat and animals and going into other types of farming and raising. And they both developed very large farms. And in fact, the Weigel farm was at one time a major dairy. We used to have Weigel's dairy milk uh, being delivered throughout the county at one time. Uh, right after they got here though, Godfrey Newbert made friends with the McNutts and he says that soon after his arrival he made an arrangement with the McNutt family for Freihoff, which is a cemetery for the German families coming into this area. and. This cemetery, uh, the McNutt Cemetery, is seated on a hill overlooking the Tennessee River. It is located at the crest of the hill and east of the McNutt Groves, starting from west where all the people were buried west to east to the family slopes down to the river. The German families could seek assistance and advice from anyone in this area about where to be buried, where to buy land, and their source, which they considered dear good friend and leader, was Godfrey Newbert. And to get to this cemetery, you would go out Riverside Drive, and it's just about a half a mile before you get to the State Farm right on the Tennessee River and that's where they're buried. The majority of the 
Chris's and the Weigel's and the Newberts at that land. Now that's the... Yes, I think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Granny Armstrong's grandparents were Godfrey Newbert and Wilhelma Weigel. And uh, she, Granny Armstrong's grandmother, uh, Wilhelma, and they, she went by the name Mimi, had, uh, there were three sisters. And those sisters were Christina, Anastasia, and Wilhelma. And they all settled in this area. And uh, Wilhelma married uh, the night she was a night counter, and she married Fritz Newbert, Godfrey's son, Fritz. And they had uh, three daughters also. And there was Meg and Ann and Fanny Lenore. And then they had, with these girls, they also had Fritz, a son, James Henry, a son, uh, Louis. So they had a grand total of six children. Now, Anne and these ladies, and in the pictures that we're showing, were very beautifully dressed. And they must have come uh, from the trunks that they brought with them and the books that the very different books that are here, they must have been on a more than just average lifestyle in Prussia. And Anne never married, and she was really beautiful. This, and Granny Armstrong was beautiful too. But Anne uh, was hit by a car down at Ramsey, right in front of where the only grocery store was, which eventually became Sid Armstrong's. Uh, and she was hit by a car and killed. So Meg and uh, Fanny were the only ones that lived. And Fanny married uh, Moses Willoughby Armstrong. And that is where we all come from. And that's all I can think of. Have we got... <clears throat> A family tree to follow mm. this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. One of the interesting thing is that while uh, Godfrey's first thing was to find burial ground and he got the McNutt Cemetery uh, and that's where Godfrey and uh, Wilhelma his Ms. Weigel are both buried, but when it came up to uh, Granny Armstrong's mother and daddy Fritz and Minnie, they're buried in the hill right behind us, which is as you go through the cut on John Severe, at the top of that hill is the Armstrong Cemetery, where also. The Robert Armstrong, who fought in the Revolutionary War, is and his Margaret Cunningham, his wife, are buried. And then Granny Armstrong and uh, Will, her husband, are both buried over in Asbury, the old part of Asbury Cemetery, as is my father, and Joe's grandfather is buried there. When I went to work at the University of Tennessee Memorial Research Center, and you can see from the picture that it was a very small part of the original hospital. We only had one wing, but we had four floors. And we had uh, different investigators that Dr. Amos Chernoff had brought into the research center from all over the world. And we had the top probably uh, gene study the Losios 
predicted more birth defects and made more discoveries in genes development in children with birth defects and really were a famous couple from South America. But I started working for a Dr. Alan Solomon who had moved into Knoxville from the National Cancer Institute where he was working and we were working on a protein and that's where I learned what immunology and what antigens and antibodies really were all about. Uh, I worked with Alan for almost a year and then Robert Lang who was the assistant director uh, had got a major grant from NCI and was needing someone to help in the development of an assay and I fell into that position. It was a very blessed day and we developed the first immunoassay to measure erythropoietin which is a hormone that controls your red blood cell production and it's critical in the patients that are on renal dialysis because they will not have enough erythropoietin and that's why their dialysis quite often fails. And it's also critical in people that are polycythemic and I know you've had friends that give a pint of blood every two months because they have too many red cells. So it was an interesting study. I learned how to bleed and immunize mice and back at the early days you did this assay by a bioassay where each sample tested was injected into a cage having 10 mice and so you had to have if you did 10 samples you had 100 mice to bleed and immunize and each cage had a hypoxic chamber on the uh, top of it and you had to take the oxygen level on those mice down to where they were really hypoxic and to where they'd have be almost to the point they'd have to give a pint of blood. They were really slow moving at that point and so we had to monitor each cage every day morning and evening and uh, I've said that my father could do most anything and he had at this time in his life got into building the first golf cart windshields and tops and designing other uh, plexiglass things for EasyGo Golf Corporation and so I came home one night and asked daddy I said can you not build us a hypoxic chamber that we can put that whole 200 mice into one big cage and only have one cage to monitor every day and so we got the membranes from GE and sure enough he built one of the most sorry about that So Daddy took the membranes from GE and he developed on this big huge plexiglass cage and it was it would hold 10 individual mice cages inside because we didn't want to turn them loose and have try to catch out each 10 to immunize so we kept the mice in the individual houses with their water bottle and food but we just had this one big cage that they all sat down in a plexiglass and we could watch them and see them and the membranes helped uh, and controlled their epoxy and the amount of oxygen they got and it worked absolutely perfect. So but at that time in the field of research and laboratory development to have an immunoassay was a lot more successful and easier to do and so Dr. Lang asked me if I couldn't make an assay for erythropoietin that would work like a pregnancy test and I did develop a hemagglutination where you're using red blood cells coated with your antigen and we had plenty of antibodies we were raising so we made our first assays. Uh, at that time my husband Doug was a rep for scientific products division of American Hospital 
and they happened to own Dade Reagents, which was one of the newest, most successful immunodiagnostic companies in America at that time. And so we went to Dade, and Dade said yes, they wanted to market the Retroportin kit, and we worked out a deal with them, but in the deal it ended up that UT was having to do all the quality control and manufacture the red blood cells. UT did not want to be involved with it. At that time they weren't interested in doing small business development. So they gave us a release, a written legal document that we could either hire somebody to do it or set up our own company. And it was decided that we would set up a company and just manufacture and supply to Dade Reagents an actual kit in a box and that way we controlled everything and had no uh, quality control problems. My father had at this point of his life was more involved with selling golf carts than doing any development work so we took over his building that my brother-in-law George had built for him and uh, we developed that in to a laboratory. We used the front room, the area that was a paint room, was our office and shipping and packaging area and the long part of the lab was used where we put in the laboratory equipment. From that because uh, Doug was with us scientific products, we were able to get all of the equipment we needed on his demo account and shipped in to our lab on Straw Plain Spike. And with that work, uh, we hired, <coughs> excuse me, with that work we hired a Ben Esri who had been an instructor in the School of Medical Technology when I was in school to be not only a sales rep to travel with the Dade Reagent salespeople, but also to help me with manufacturing. And in developing a company, it came out really quick that the people who set up JCL, which was Bob Lang and Amos Chernoff and Marie Coleman and myself, uh, none of us had ever operated a business. Those, Dr. Coleman was a physician who was on a staff at UT and the Dr. Chernoff and Dr. Lang were both researchers who'd only lived off of government grants. And when it came time to pay for the equipment, uh, there wasn't any money to pay for it. And I went up to Dandridge and talked to Uncle Fred who had Tennessee handbags at that time. And I told him what we were doing. And since Granny Brimmer had died of aplastic anemia, he was a little aware of what I was talking about with the red blood cells. And so Fred came down and met with the doctors. And after that, he went home and said he'd let me know. and. He called me the next day and said those doctors may be the top physicians and researchers in the world, but they didn't know how to re do any business operations. And the only way he would do it would be if I was in control of it and that I would have to handle and be directly responsible to him. Well, Dr. Uh, Coleman and Dr. Lyon wouldn't agree to let it be set up that way. So Fred sent me cashier checks down from Dandridge by one of his people to buy out what little bit of stock and it was less than two thousand dollars that uh, Coleman and Lang and Chernoff had put in. And I took those to the UT and delivered them and got their release and their stock back and then I set up the company new with making Fred the major shareholder and mother and daddy and myself and I had to have a pathologist because now without Dr. Coleman 
I had no way to get biological serums and tissue. So Doug, knowing all the pathologists in town, he went up to Tom Potter's at Memorial Hospital and I went with him and we talked with Tom and told him we wouldn't be paying him a salary but we'd give him stock and maybe if we made some money then we would renegotiate it. And so Tom came on board and became a shareholder and that was the development of JCL. At the same time as we were working on getting the Ruth Report and kits and the labeling and the products made and uh, packaging and sent to uh, Dade Reagents for delivery, Dade wanted me to do workshops. And that first year, I did 64 workshops throughout the United States teaching people how to run assays for erythropoietin. Along with the fact that at the same time at UT, Dr. Coleman had asked me to work and see if I could not make the CEA test which Phil Gold had made the front page of Life magazine about having the first tumor marker that would identify colon cancer. Right? <coughs> So I went back to Johnson City and met with Dr. Potter and I told him about what we'd done and he was really interested to do it. So he collected us the first colon tumors that he got in and uh, he would had done a lot of reading about what had been published about CEA and he would call and tell me I've got a really big case coming up. Can you all get scheduled to come up here tomorrow at 10 to get the tissue? Because we didn't want to freeze it. We wanted to get it and extract it as soon as it was removed and he was through with it. And at that time, different from today, the pathologist owned any biological samples that came into his laboratory in the state of Tennessee. The state did not regulate laboratory tests at that time and the state didn't control the pathologists as they do today. So what Dr. Potter, once he did all of the testing that was necessary on tissue, he could either put it in the disposal units at the hospital or whatever he wanted to. So he would wrap it up in saran wrap and stick it in their biological refrigerator and most of the time Daddy and I would drive to Johnson City to get the tissue and we started and extracted uh, and made our first uh, tumor marker test. Now to begin with this t test is done by extracting that tumor and using that to produce your antibodies. Uh, typically I went through chemistry at UT by playing in Dr. Robinson's son band and I never did really learn a lot of the math in Quan and Qual. So I made up my normal acids to extract this tissue and when Doug got in the next day and checked it after I'd already extracted it and immunized the goats with it. He said, you've made a major mistake. That's not close. And so we called Dr. Potter and Dr. Potter said, well, I don't have any more tissue right now, so let's just see what happens and the next time I get one, we'll try again. So we did and I think it was directly a blessing from God because the process worked. We made an antibody that detected not just colon cancer, but it has been since proven to detect greater than 96% of early stages of colon cancer. And that's the beginning of our lab business. Ready. I've forgotten where I ended. That's how you got in the lab business. Oh, that's how. Okay. We, at this time, Dr. Potter felt like 
that we should find out what the federal government was expecting from a laboratory test. He was involved with the Red Cross and he was a Red Cross director for the state of Tennessee and he knew that the Red Cross was getting ready to regulate blood bank typing serums. So uh, we got our attorney that Fred Rimmer had gotten for us, which turned out to be uh, Dennis Inman from Marstown. And Dennis was uh, the son of Judge Inman and uh, he himself has since become a judge. But we were his very first case out of UT after he graduated. And so Dennis and Dr. Potter and I set up a meeting with a Dr. Ellisberg who headed that division of the food and drug and caught a United Airline to Washington one bright spring day. And to tell you the difference in today, and it was so much fun, that United Airlines served pancakes with link sausages on it going to Washington. And now you don't even get peanuts. But anyway, that's the difference in 1971 and 2007. But uh, when we met with Ellisberg, he told us that the Food and Drug had no regulatory rights on uh, any laboratory tests at that time but they had asked Congress to give them the rights. And we were already beginning and had sold a couple of kits in state to pathologists in Memphis. And they asked us, the food and drug said, will you please take your test off the market and we'll look at it more favorably than if you leave it on uh, when we get our uh, guidelines from the Congress. And as we came home, Dennis said we well, didn't think we had any option but to stop selling it and taking it off. That's the first business mistake I made because all tests that were being sold when Congress passed the law had a grandfather clause on it and we would have been automatically left on the market. And that would have been back in 72. So at that time, once the law came through, you had to put in what was called a pre-market approval. And we submitted our pre-market approval three weeks before Hoffman LaRoche submitted their pre-market approval for the CEA test that Dr. Gold had developed. With that uh, experience, Hoffman LaRoche was approved in less than six months and our application was refused. And we went through 10 years of battling with the food and drug. And at our last meeting with them as a full blown their review board, one of the investigators who had made a week's audit at our lab here in Knoxville took Doug and myself out and he said, unless you get a major company to buy this or you get federal grants, you're never going to get it approved by our food and drug. So we went back home and started working towards getting a grant. I need to cut and we need to insert. I left out Dow. Okay. okay. <clears throat>Okay. okay. After we came back and took the product off the market, we attended some national medical laboratory meetings and met up with a Dr. Jim Seed who headed up the laboratory division of Dow Chemical Company. And Jim was very interested in the product and we were able to negotiate a contract with him in the round 78 uh, was when the contract started and Dow was big enough they went to FDA and got approval for us to manufacture the product in bulk in Knoxville, Tennessee and ship it in refrigerated uh, cartons that were specially made to uh, Ireland 
and just when we got ready and we got our submission almost finished uh, our project leader Bill Steropoulos with Dow uh, was the project leader and he had convinced Dow that they were a chemical company and should stay out of the laboratory business. So Dow canceled our contract right when we thought we were going on the market. And Jim Seed left Dow and went immediately with Sherwood Medical, uh, took our contract that was used at Dow, which he had copies of, rechanged it, and in within three months we had a new contract with Sherwood. And in six months uh, we had product and uh, they Sherwood arranged for me to make the first scientific presentation at the major immunology meeting of tumor markers in Brussels, Belgium. And after that we came home and they had gotten approval from the food and drug for us to do the same thing of manufacturing bulk and shipping out. So we shipped to a thigh Ireland uh, large cartons about the size of a refrigerator and they would hold four to eight of the bottles with enough uh, reagents to make a couple of thousand kits in each shipment. And then Doug and I went to a thigh and set up the bottling process and taught the people there how to run the quality control. And the product was on the market and beginning to be sold outside of the research community into the actual laboratories. At this point, uh, American Home was in the business of acquiring hospital supply houses and Sherwood manufactured more hospital supplies than laboratory. So American Home bought uh, Sherwood Medical and canceled our contract at the time of the acquisition. From that we started working on trying to get a grant because we found out that the National Cancer Institute was giving grants for evaluation of new tumor markers. And we went through four years of writing grants and having them turned down until Dr. Potter got Jimmy Quillen, his congressman, to meet with us in NCI and that grant application was approved. And we then had the funds uh, in mid-80s to develop the new technology which is monoclonal antibodies and to make an immunoassay ELISA which is a much more sensitive test than the one we had on the market. We received two grants, one to make new monoclonal antibodies and the second grant to make the assay and after the completion of that work being successful we were funded for another year to do clinical evaluations. And out of that we had the test evaluated in 18 different laboratories in the United States, one in the Philippines uh, Islands and one in Europe. And the product was moving along very rapidly in the development. Also at the same time our erythropoietin sales had dropped off completely because the company Amgen had finally found out how to make an erythropoietin drug. But because the drug cost $5,000 per treatment per kidney patient and they needed it three times a month, they were having trouble selling it and the market wasn't increasing. So Amgen made their own erythropoietin kit and would give it to any of the doctors who were buying the drug. They could get the test for free. And so that cut us completely out of having any income in JCL as far as that product. So at this point we needed to find a buyer or either... Let's pause right there. While we were trying to figure out about how to support uh, JCL and our employees that we had, which were four, uh, we had worked 
on a different test because our daughter Maxie had miniature horses and she had been trying to breed them and without any luck and when we talked to the uh, Dr. Stone from the vet school at UT about a pregnancy test for horses he just laughed at us. So by accident I met Dr. Trellfall who headed up the therogenology group at Ohio State and is probably one of the top reproductive specialist today uh, in the US and out and so we talked about it and he said well what we needed was something that would detect it early and with working with him and doing some research I was able to finally get a product where I isolated a protein that uh, appeared to have never been found before that would identify uh, conception because I could tell if a horse was bred within eight hours after breeding her and so Dr. Trellfall sent me a group of samples from Ohio State and we ran them and I got 80% of them right so he had us uh, he said what's really needed I know you want a horse test but the dairy industry is about to go under in this world and he said we can't get the cows bred and it's taking up to nine months to get the best producers bred so uh, Dr. Trellfall collected more cow samples this time and I isolated the protein and uh, we were able to meet up with uh, Dr. Miller at A.H. Robbins pharmaceutical company at a show and Dr. Miller had a big interest in this so they said that they work, would like to work on it and work with us and they were setting up a diagnostic company also so we've signed a contract with H. Robbins to uh, help us characterize the protein and uh, it turned out they not only characterized it but I was able to get a patent on it for that protein for early conception in all mammals and then uh, at the same time H. Robbins having uh, cancer treatment drugs available to them that they were working on were interested in our cancer test and it was called Tenogen when we marketed it in Europe and we had kept that name and so uh, the Robbins group signed a second contract with us to get uh, FDA approval of the Tenogen test in the US. We were working on that and had some of the submission ready and clinical trials in process when our friend American Home came along and because A.H. Robbins was in a lawsuit over their Dacron Shield and the Robbins family wasn't interested in fighting the lawsuit they sold the company to American Home and American Home consequently canceled both of our contracts in three weeks and that was the end of our association although we did get the characterization of our early conception factor and a lot of work revalidated on the cancer test during that time Cut. Following the cancellation of the H. Robbins contract, uh, Dr. Trellfall at Ohio State had given several talks from Australia and Europe and the U.S. and there was a large interest in the cattle ECF test and we started making the test into what is not a lab test but a lateral flow test that can be uh, done at the in the dairy barn while the cows are being milked and so we learned a brand new technology uh, Uncle Fred bought us the equipment to manufacture the test and we put the product on the market and uh, we had some money also for doing advertising and marketing 
and we started getting enough sales from the ECF test to support the company again and start back on more clinical trials on our cancer test. And we would, Doug and I did big shows at the World Dairy Show in Madison, Wisconsin and then out in Tulare County, California uh, where they're having dairies of five to ten thousand uh, head herds there and where the big market was. And then the small shows which still paid us the most money uh, Doug and our friend Walt Anen would do the Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware and up in that area in the Midwest little shows. <coughs> uh, the ECF test was beginning to take off really good with the uh, cow industry and we went back to working on getting it ready for the horse industry and getting that validated and Dr. Trail Fall and Middle Tennessee State University had a big horse program at that time were also interested in it and we were doing clinical trials and working with their people. Uh, by this time Uncle Fred had had his a major heart attack and he felt like, and I did too, uh, not only had Fred had a heart attack but Doug had had a heart attack that we just needed to find a buyer for the company. And so in 2000 we started putting all our efforts in to getting the clinical trials done on the cancer test to find a buyer for that and let the ECF go where it would. <coughs> During this time we had uh, several venture capital groups and a lot of time spent with different companies and in different types of negotiation. But we ended up in 2005 uh, selling the uh, company stock to a man named Tom Boyd who set up a company that Doug gave him the name of EDP which Doug felt like covered early detection products. With that prop test, Tom being not familiar with anything in the medical field and finding it extremely difficult to work with doctors, uh, took us a while to get our scientific advisory board put together in 2007 uh, Doug had died from a heart attack, Fred had died from a heart attack and Dr. Potter had died from a hospital accident when he went in for some surgery. So I was the only one left of the original group of JCL and uh, we finally got to the point that we had a good scientific advisory board. I had got Tom to get Herb Fritchie from MD Anderson who I'd worked with since the 70s on different bases and Dr. Trailfall for the ECF product and then uh, Gene Overholt stepped up as head of the scientific advisory board and that was great because he had developed the colonoscopy equipment so that was a natural fit with our early detection. And then Dr. Don Wheeler who had been doing our statistics for us since the 70's for all of our publications and meetings with the government and the grant field. So EDP started let's, off on a good note. Let's pause right So EDP started off on a good note. Okay. So EDP started off on a good note. Uh, the problem with EDP is Tom was unable to direct or manage a lab and he didn't want me doing anything. And uh, the people he went through four presidents in a very short time and uh, 
He had one that embezzled from him and one that was turned out to be a federal in a federal lawsuit on criminal actions to begin with. He only had one that was really great, but that person was not able to work with Tom and left the company. But even through all of that turmoil, we were able to, in 2015, get the first peer-reviewed publication in a major gastroenterology publication on the test which was now named colon marker and this publication shows and proves that it detects greater than 96 percent of early cancers. Following that we applied for approval to ship out of the United States the kits and that's called a CE mark. Uh, the guidelines are quite similar to FDA uh, and but it's much quicker to get than going through FDA. So Colin Marker got approved and got an approval of their CE mark which gave us uh, rights to ship to anywhere in the world except for China, Japan, Canada and the US. The only countries that we're not CE marked in. And then in September the 5th of 2017 we received the US patent on colon marker for the markers, tumor markers for early stage cancer detection. 